us enter into his gates with thanksgiving for just a minute and we just start worshiping him just because he brought us here tonight just because he's good just because he's blessed you just because whatever he's still god amen let's just give the lord a hand clap of praise and worship for a minute after you
but what we're going to receive later at a later time right. if we hold fast to the truth, if we hold fast to the teaching. So persecuted they the prophets. That reward that it speaks about there is dues paid for work. And I wrote this out beside it, faithfulness. Well, the trick talked about holding on. We'll talk about faithfulness a little bit later on, but it's dues paid for work. It's dues paid for your faithfulness to God. Yes. And in looking at this beatitude, we, we talked about the beatitude. They are a progressive nature. And if you look at it, it basically comes full circle because when you look at poor in spirit, the Bible says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yes. And when you get to the persecution, it says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's full circle. It's a, it's a stair step, if you will, as you progress. If you never were poor, poor in spirit, if you were never one that was born, or if you never one was in a relationship with God, if you were never meek, which means power under control, Sister Tina, if you never was hunger and thirst after righteousness, if you never was merciful, if you never were pure in heart, and if you never were a peacemaker, you would never be able to make it to being persecuted. Those things build you up to a certain place in our walk with God, in our step with God. They build us up to that, that place. It says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. I, begin to, I begin to think about this and just begin to come back to my mind. And before the pandemic set in, we were teaching on exploring God's Word. We were looking at the Beatitudes. And I look back and I think about the irony of what's going on now. And I'm not going to make this a political thing. And I've got some other stuff I want to say later. Uh, talk to Brother Donnie a little bit before church. But I was preparing to teach on blessed on the persecuted. And I remember back at that time, I'm thinking, do I really, really know what persecution is? Do I, do I really understand that? Oh, we think kids make fun of us at school. You know, we've all had people say things to us that were ugly because we live the way that we do. But do we actually know what persecution is? And these things begin to happen with this pandemic. You know, we were freely able to come to church. We were freely able to worship. And the First Amendment gives us that right, if you, if you will read it. It talks about no laws being passed against our religious freedom. And things begin to change. The government began to do what it did, and the lawmakers began to do what it did, and it told us what we could do and told us what we couldn't do. Now, some of you may go along with that, some of you may not. Like I said, I'm not going to make it political tonight. Even in the state of California tonight and today, they're still not being able to go to church. They've got rallies and they've got things going on, but they're not allowed to go to church. They're not allowed to gather together and worship as we are. And I know we went through a, a period of it. We went through a trial basis of it. But after COVID hit and these things began to take place, I began to think about this passage of Scripture and thought about what if it really comes down <coughs> excuse me, to one of these days when we're told that we can never come to church again. Right. What if we're told that we can't worship like we want to worship? Are we going to be faithful? Are we going to be faithful to God? Are we going to have enough in us that's been put in us that we're going to be able to stand? When you look at persecution, persecution means to be pursued. It means to be followed after or suffered, to chase after, to run after with a hostile intent, to hunt or put to flight or drive away. Persecution in all its variations of this word used in the Bible 76 times, if you will. It has a, a strong meaning of being followed or chased after, like you're hunting down prey. If you're looking for something that you want to kill, that big deer, Brother Larry, that you might be after, but you're hunting down, that's what persecution means. The Lord says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Remember in the third beatitude, He said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I wrote this down and I began to think about that. Seeking after the right things of God and a desire to do the right thing and live a holy life may bring persecution to our life. 
You ever thought about it like that? Yes. I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to live the right way. I'm trying to live the way God wants me to. But it may bring persecution, Sister Maria. Yes. Different kinds of uh, persecution within the Bible. Uh, there was persecution by hand, which is physical violence, if you will. Uh, we read about Paul being stoned. He was left, he was left to die. Uh, we read about them being whipped and beaten and things that they had to endure and go through. Things that we might never ever face. I pray the Lord that we don't. We might not ever have to go through that. There's people in other countries that have faced that. Right now because they have wanted to hold on to God and not denounce their faith. Because they're, 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 they're true to God. Persecution of the tongue. People talk about you. People say things about you. He said, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you. And word revile, as I said, means to criticize. It means to insult. It means to slander. This beatitude, this, it's the last beatitude as you look at it. It's the longest beatitude. It's three verses. It's the only beatitude with a command, Brother Larry. He tells them to rejoice. When you go through this, it's the only beatitude with an explanation of what's going to take place, what's going to happen, what's going to be your reward, if you will. It's the only one that's uh, repeated by Jesus. And since it's the last one, I think it's the climax of all the other beatitudes before it. You could, like I said earlier, you couldn't go through all that and not get to where you're going to be persecuted. John 15 and 20 says that they persecuted me. This is Jesus speaking. They will also persecute you. He just left it at it like that. Question, how, how can we do this? How can we go through this? It's our perspective of what we're looking at. I mean, I've got something else I'll talk about a little bit later, but I want to I talk to you for just a little bit about the church of Smyrna. There were seven letters written to the seven churches of the book of Revelation. And there were two churches that were uh, good churches, if you will. The church of Smyrna... In the church of Philadelphia. And I just want to leave a, a little bit with this with you tonight as I get to where I'm going to talk to you at the end. But Revelation 2, 8 and 11. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write these things, said the first and the last. Which was dead and is alive. He was crucified and he rose from the dead. He was alive. He was quick. There was a quickening. He was the Alpha and Omega. He was the beginning and the end. He said, I know thy works and tribulations and poverty. But thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are in the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you in prison that you may be tried. And you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. Seven letters written to seven actual churches in Asia. When you look at the city of Smyrna, it was a it was a, a port city. It was on the coast of Asia Minor, if you will. It was founded around 1000 B.C. and it was destroyed around 600 B.C. by war. It was later rebuilt. It was a beautiful city. It was a second only to Ephesus at its time and it was referred to for the Larius, the crown of Asia. The people were referred to it. It was famous for its studies of science, its studies of medicine, and its majestic buildings. It was a beautiful place to visit. It was a, a free city, if you will, one that knew that uh, many of loyalty to Rome, and like most cities. Cicero, which was a statement at that time, called it one of our most faithful and our most ancient allies. And I'm not talking about the church of Smyrna yet. I'm talking about the city of Smyrna. It was dedicated to Rome and to the cause of Rome. It was the first city to build a temple to the goddess called Roma, which was a female deity that represented Rome, if you will. They made this huge statue of her there. Her loyalty to Rome was famous in the ancient worlds. So the letter to the church tells them at Smyrna to be thou faithful unto death. Be faithful unto me no matter what you go through. Be faithful to me no matter what you face in your life. No matter the persecution that's going to come upon you, I want you to be faithful unto me no matter what happens. The name Smyrna 
very interesting. It means bitter. It comes from the Greek word for myrrh, which speaks of a fragrance or perfume that comes from myrrh being beaten or crushed. The only way to take this, what they call myrrh, and to get the fragrance out of it, to get it to smell, and it had a, a beautiful smell to it, was to beat it or to crush it. And that's what the word Smyrna means. The name is fitting for the church of Smyrna because it had experienced bitter times. The church was under attack. They were being persecuted. And the Lord tells them, Sister Marie, He said, I know thy works. I know what you're doing. I know what you're going through. I know how hard you're working. I know what you're facing. I know everything about you. I know thy works. I know the tribulation and the poverty. But the Lord tells me, He said, you're rich. I know what the people are saying about you. I see how hard you're working. <coughs> it uses the word tribulation, which means pressure. I thought this was interesting as I studied this. The word tribulation means pressure. The Greek word for tribulation refers to the grinding of grapes by a millstone. Kind of like that myrrh was ground or crushed. One writer said that tribulation or persecution was used to describe a man being put to death by a huge boulder being laid up on top of him. It's not a pretty sight. It's not something that we want to think about. Not a pretty image. And the church members that were at Smyrna were having their property seized. They were having their citizenship revoked. Their business in their homes and their land were taken away from them. And they were being thrown in prison because of their loyalty and their dedication to God. Remember what I said earlier, without no relationship with God, there's not going to be any persecution. No persecution if you don't have a relationship with God. They were being lied on, people were talking about it. If you want to look at it like this, it was basically he said they were from the church of Satan. They were of the synagogue of Satan, if you will. And I see your poverty, meaning you don't have anything. Nothing. This was the church at Smyrna. This is what these people were facing. Just difficult times and things that just kind of hard to believe that they were going through. They had all these things going on, and the Lord tells them, He said, Some of you are even going to be thrown in prison. You're going to be put to death. These are things that, that you're going to be you're going to be facing. It says you have tribulation for ten days, which talks about ten church periods of tribulation that people went through in those times. But be thou faithful to me, and I will give thee a crown of life. I begin to look at this and begin to study that, and I begin to think about why, why was this? Why were they going through this persecution? And basically it boiled down because of their refusal to acknowledge Caesar as Lord. Caesar was the ruler at the time, and it was because of their refusal to acknowledge Caesar as Lord. Once a year, Roman citizens had to burn incest on the altar to the Godhead of Caesar. If they did, they were given a certificate to show that they had performed this religious rite. And if a person refused to do so, he was marked as being disloyal or a rebel. So these people, this church, they were refusing to do this. They were refusing to say, Caesar's my Lord. They said, God is my Lord. I'm being faithful to them. I'm being faithful unto him. History tells us of a man by the name of Polycarp. And from what I can tell by studying Brother Donnie, he was actually the minister of the church there, or the bishop of the church there at Smyrna. And on a particular festival day, they were having this big festival. A lot of times they would dance and they would, they would praise Caesar. They would praise these different gods. And the people there, there were several Christians that had already been martyred. And some of the people began to holler for Polycarp to come forth. For Polycarp to come out of the crowd. So they went into the crowd and they seized him. And they demanded that he would renounce his faith. And worship Caesar or die. One of the policemen even said, What harm is it to say Caesar is Lord? Offer a sacrifice and be saved. Why don't you just do it? It's easy. Caesar's my Lord. Offer the sacrifice. You're going to go on about your life. Everything's going to be all right. All you had to do was just say the words. But Polycarp looked at him in the eye and very firm. He said, Jesus Christ is my Lord. 
Jesus Christ is my Lord. Caesar's not my Lord. Jesus Christ is my Lord. They led him into the arena and they gave him another chance to renounce his faith. And Polycarp looked at him and he said, Eighty and six years have I served Christ and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? Because of his unwavering faith, Polycarp was burned alive at the stake that very day. He put him on stake, set him on fire and burned to death. But he was not willing to say that Caesar was Lord. He was not willing to say that I will serve another. That I, th This life has been too good to me. God has been too good to me. We look at that, we look at that today and we think, well, we might not ever have to face anything like that. We might not ever have to go through anything like that. I ask you, I really don't know. With the way the world is anymore, with things going, I, I really don't know. But would I? You can ask yourself that, but would I be willing to stand there and do that? Would I be willing to stand there and go through that? And die for God? It's something, it's something to think about. I'm not saying it's going to happen. But things are dark in the world that we live in today. Things don't look good in the world that we're living in today. I believe that the trumpet could sound at any minute. We'll be called home. Anytime. Ellen Keller said character cannot be developed in the ease and quiet. <laughs> Only through experience of trial, suffering, can the soul be strengthened. Ambition inspired and success be achieved. The world may not have seen Polycarp as a success, but God did. God did. Hebrews chapter 11. We can probably quote some of it. Probably quote the first two verses. I want to read it in the New Living Translation. It's called the Faith Chapter. And if I had one message tonight through everything that we're going to go through, through everything that we have to endure that life has to throw at us, keep the faith. Keep the faith. Hold on to the faith. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 in the New Living Translation says, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things that we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. And it's by faith we understand that the entire universe was formed by God's command. And that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. He spoke into existence and it happened. He said, let it be and it became. It takes faith on our part to believe that. The roll call of faith, if you will, of people throughout the Bible and the stories that we have heard. And in Hebrews 11, 32 through 40, there's kind of a divide in it from where it first starts out to where it goes. Because it says, and this is the New Living Translation again, it says, how much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouth of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength, and they became strong in battle and put a whole army to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death. And then it kind of changes direction a little bit when you start talking about faith. It says, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in their order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half and others were killed with a sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that they 
will not reach perfection without us. Well, there you go. I looked at that last part and I thought, what does that have to do with us? We're going to have to learn to stand the test of time. We're going to have to learn to stand too, no matter what we face. Our faith is going to have to be strong in whatever we have to endure and whatever we have to go through. I, I, like I said, I, I really don't know, but I kept coming back to this. I looked at other things. And, uh, Brother Gill asked me last week to teach tonight. I kept coming back to this. But they kept the faith. They held on to what God had promised to them. No matter what they had to endure, some of those were victors. Some of them lived uh, victorious lives. But yet some of them lost their life because of what they believed. Begin to, begin to look at that. I begin to, to think about that. And the Lord tells the church at Smyrna, He said, you're poor, but you're rich. And Brother Terrence, this kind of goes along with what the pastor said Sunday, Sunday morning about our perspective. What we're looking at. Are we looking at the earthly? Or are we looking at the heavenly? I begin to think about that. I begin to just, just let it go over in my mind. And, and I thought about this. When our vision changes, then our mission changes. Mm-hmm. When our vision changes, when I go from here to here, then my mission changes. My faith takes me from here to here. To what God's got in store for me. For what God's got in plan for me. Faith. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When we have faith, we're saying we believe the Bible is true. And what it says about Jesus Christ is true. He is the only way to salvation. And He's preparing us a place in heaven. And that this life is not all there is. The Bible tells us if we had hope in this life only, if this is all that it had to offer, we'd be all men most miserable. There's a better place. Faith has the ability and the strength to see past all the pain and suffering in this life and to hold on to eternity. To hold on to what God's got for us. Faith reaches from the present and into the future and embraces realities of eternity into our temporal existence. I know there's a better place. I know there's a better, better place. Without faith, the Christian life appears highly irrelevant. Totally insane and entirely worthless. But with faith, you can see the unseen. You can see the unseen when you have faith in your life. When you have that faith to hold on, that no matter what I'm facing, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm going to have to endure, that everything's going to be all right. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, If you be risen with Christ... Seek these things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And that means power, if you will. Set your affections on things above and not on things on this earth. Matthew 6, 19 and through 21 says, lay, up, lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. The word thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What you treasure, what you hold on to, what you consider valuable to me, that's where your heart is going to be also. The church of Smyrna was poor in material things, but they were rich in heavenly and spiritual things, Brother Larry. He tells them to be faithful. Because their reward is going to be a crown of life. It was called Stefano. It was the Stefano crowd. And it was given to the victor of an athlete who had completed a race or completed an event. And they placed a crown on their head because they had finished their course. As Paul talks about. They were given it, given to it by a judge. James 1 and 12 says, Blessed is the man that endured temptation." For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. I wrote this down, and I think it, I think it makes a lot of sense. Persecution has always made this church go stronger. You look at the church in the book of Acts, 
persecution began to happen, they began to get stronger. The disciples went out and they preached. I got another whole page of scriptures that I'm not going to read to you tonight because I think I've made my point. But they went out and they preached this gospel and they were taken back in and they were beaten. They were turned loose. You know where they went? They went right back out to the street going to preach. They had something. It didn't make sense, Sister man, but they had something in them. They, they had something in them that propelled them. Respond to persecution by affirming our commitment to God and to His people and to His work in the world. Persecution will either drive you away from God and cause you to become bitter, or it will drive you closer to God and cause you to become better. I, just, I, I, I want to leave this with you, and I know that we're facing some things in the United States where we're at. Like I said, the, the state of California has passed laws that they cannot congregate or have church, even though other things are going on. There's rallies going on and different things such as that. I consider that persecution against the church, if you will. It said a woman in India watches as her sister is dragged off by Hindu nationals. She doesn't know if her sister is dead or alive. A man in North Korea prison camp is shaken awake after being beaten unconscious and then the beginning is beat again because of his religious faith. A woman in Nigeria runs for her life. She has escaped from Boko Haram who kidnapped her. She's pregnant and when she returns home, her community will reject her and her baby because of her faith in Christ. A group of children are laughing and talking as they come down to their church sanctuary after eating together. These things actually take place and instantly many of them were killed by a bomb blast. It was Easter Sunday in Sri Lanka. These people don't live in the same region or even the same continent, but they share an important characteristic. They were all Christians, and they suffered because of their faith. While Christian persecution takes many forms, it is defined as any hostility experienced as a result of our identification with Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, no relationship. You don't have to worry about persecution. You don't have to be, be afraid of that right there. We live in trying times. We live in difficult times. We live in a time of the unknown. We don't know what's taking place. Talking to Brother Donnie, like I said, before church, and I read, studied, I got several papers, there were several different things on them, but several of the church church people or church uh, pastors within the state of California have, have put up petitions and they've even petitioned the Supreme Court to be able to begin to have church. As Brother Art Hodges, which is a Pentecostal denomination, and John McAuliffe, which is not, they desire to be able to go back to church. And there's been different states, and this has happened in different states. And like I said, the First Amendment gives us the right to be able to gather together. So that's, that is a form of persecution. And we don't know what else we'll face. But I wanted to let you to know tonight, keep the faith. Be faithful to God. Be faithful to your calling to God. Don't let anything stand in your way. Don't let anything stop you from living for God. Keep the faith. Will you stand with me? Anybody got anything they'd like to say? Or? Brother David, Yeah. as you were teaching, it came to my mind that Persecution does strengthen the church, but one of the reasons that it does strengthen the church is because if you look back over history, any group that has ever been persecuted or come against, they band together. They rely on each other, and as a group and as a whole, it makes them stronger. So you said that as persecution can either push you away from God and make you bitter, or it can strengthen you. And I think a lot of where you go, whether you're going to go further out and become bitter, or whether you're going to come closer to God and become stronger, right. is whether you ban... Who, who, are your, who are you listening to during that period of time? Exactly. Are you listening to your church friends? Are you listening to other saints of God who may have been through <coughs> what you've been through or what you're going through at the time? Or are you listening to somebody that has no clue, or are you not listening at all? Or are you just pulling yourself away and isolating yourself? So I think that if we 
during times of persecution would draw closer to each other, that in turn is going to draw us closer to God. I thought about it as I and I thought about it in my lesson. We talked about it the next Sunday morning. Peter's thrown in jail. He's in jail, and it talks about, I believe it's three gates. That dude's back here. He's asleep. He's, he's thrown in jail, and he's asleep. Take, think about that for a minute. He's back there sleeping. The angel had to wake him up and said, Hey, dude, get up. We're getting out of here. He, wake, he, he stands up, chains fall out. Door opens. Second door opens. Third door opens. He goes to the house of Robert, I believe it was. They're praying. Free Peter. She goes to the door. He's standing there. And she goes back in and tells the church, say, Hey, I don't know if I've seen a ghost. I don't know what I've seen. But I think Peter's at the door. So I kind of wonder where her faith was at. But as she said, when we bind together, there's strength right here, folks. There's strength in this church. See too many miracles happen. See too many things take place. There's strength in this church. And I'm, I'm thankful for it. Keep the faith in us. Keep the faith in us. We got any uh, announcements we need to make? I don't know. I'll look at the bulletin here. We had a care package to the New Hope. It's due tonight, right? Well, it's the deadline already. Uh, ladies' night, Tuesday night, October 6th at 6 o'clock. Cookbook exchange. Bring a cookbook to exchange with somebody else. Give some different ideas, Sister Sharon. Uh, <laughs> she does a good job cooking. Uh, please bring a picture for the wall in the ladies' prayer room or give it to Sister Man and she will help you. Somebody to pray for, I would is that assume that's what you're talking about. Uh, put a face to a name to, uh, to look at. So glad everybody's here. We got a good looking crowd, good spirit here tonight. So thank you. Yeah, Brother Patrick, good to see you, buddy. Good to see you smile on face on the front row. Oh, that is fantastic. God is good. God is good. Lord, we ask you to go with us tonight. Be with us. Keep your hand upon us. Protect us. Watch over our pastor tonight as we're coming home. We ask you, Lord, that you bring us back Sunday morning, Lord. We're ready to worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.